And one of the biggest sins in Islam at number 10 is not fasting. Now I'm going to be mentioning three sins in this one, but I'm going to be keeping it all into just one fact. Breaking the fast of Ramadan or not fasting in that month without any valid excuse is a big sin. Now the Prophet Muhammad said Islam is built upon five pillars testifying that there is no true God except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. There is performing the prayers, paying the zakat, hajj, which is a pilgrimage to Mecca, as well as fasting during the month of Ramadan. And that's found in the Hadith Sahih al-Jami number 2837. Now the sin coming in at number nine is dishonoring parents. And there's a passage in the Quran, specifically in Surah 7 verses 23, and it says this, and your Lord has decreed that you not worship except him. And to parents, good treatment, whether one or both of them reach old age, while with you say not to them so much as oof, and do not repel them, but speak to them a noble word. I mean, that kind of goes without saying, you know, they are your parents for the most part, you know, do your best to honor them. I know sometimes it's easier said than done, but yeah, that's another big sin in Islam. The next sin at number eight is cutting off relationships. Now this was a pretty surprising one. And as a matter of fact, in the Quran, Surah 47 verses 22 to 23, it says, so would you perhaps, if you turned away, cause corruption on earth and sever your ties of relationship? Those who do so are the ones that Allah has cursed. So he deafened them and blinded their vision. Now, of course, this, like every other verse, needs to be taken into context. But this is one of the verses that Muslims use to show that, well, yeah, cutting off relationships like this really causes corruption on the planet. And that's one reason why they believe that there's so much division on earth. And it's definitely something that is frowned upon in the religion of Islam. The next sin is levying illegal taxes. So in the Hadith Sahih al-Jami number 87, it says this, the Prophet Muhammad said, do you know who the bankrupt is? The bankrupt from my nation is the one who appears on the day of resurrection, having performed the prayers, fasted and paid the zakat, but had also abused that person, slandered that person, wrongfully taken the wealth of that person and spilled the blood of that person. These people will take from his good deeds. If his good deeds are thereby exhausted, he will be given their sins and then he will be thrown into the hell fire. So bottom line, don't be overcharging people. Don't be throwing any kind of illegal charges as well. This is a big sin in Islam. Sin at number six is arrogance. And this is mentioned in the Quran, Surah 16, verses 23. And it says, Assuredly, Allah knows that they conceal and what they declare. Indeed, he does not like the arrogant. Pretty straightforward. So we got five more sins to take a look at. At number five, we have slandering women. And this is mentioned in the Quran, specifically in Surah 24 verses 23. And this is what it says. Indeed, those who falsely accuse, chaste, unaware, and believing women are cursed in this world and the hereafter, and they will have a great punishment. Next up at number four, we are looking at the sin of bribery. Now the Quran talks about this in Surah 2 verses 188. It says, and do not consume one another's wealth unjustly or send it in bribery to the rulers in order that they might aid you to consume a portion of the wealth of the people in sin while you know it is unlawful. So avoid all kind of bribes. If you know something is like really, really wrong and illegal and just inhumane, don't be accepting money from it. Perhaps if you guys want, we can dive a little bit more in another episode. But let's move on now to sin number three, and this is drinking alcohol, a pretty big one. And most people who aren't even Muslim know this about the religion of Islam. This is like a big sin. Avoid alcohol, but not just alcohol, any intoxicants. And in the Quran, Surah 5, verses 90, it says, O you who have believed indeed, intoxicants, gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan. So avoid it that you may be successful. So again, that passage mentioned multiple things, but the thing that stood out there was really avoiding intoxicants. The next big sin at number two, is adultery and fornication. Again, this is something that even non-Muslims are very familiar with when it comes to the religion of Islam, one of the things that are forbidden. And we find reference to this in the Quran, Surah 17, verses 32. And what does it say? It says this, and do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Indeed, it is ever an immorality and is 
evil as a way. And we reached number one in this episode. Now this is one that a lot of people don't necessarily take into consideration, but it's a sin of committing suicide. This is also a very big one in the religion of Islam. In the Quran, Surah 4 verses 29, it says this, O you who have believed, do not consume one another's wealth unjustly, but only in lawful business by mutual consent. And do not kill yourself or one another. Indeed, Allah is to you ever merciful. So again, it doesn't matter how bad life seems to go or how much you're currently suffering right now. In the religion of Islam, you're advised to not take your own life because that is a sin. So let's start off with number 10. And here we have them. Now this is related to the sins committed against God in the Quran, Surah 3, verses 15 to 16. It says, Say, shall I inform you of something better than that? For those who fear Allah will be gardens in the presence of their Lord, beneath which rivers flow, wherein they abide eternally, and purified spouses and approval from Allah. And Allah is seeing of his servants, those who say, O Lord, indeed we have believed, so forgive us our sins sins and protect us from the punishment of the fire. So when Thamb is used in this example in the Quran, it really talks a lot about the type of sin that is punishable in the afterlife. So in fact, Thamba is considered a great sin and it's often used in the Quran in contrast with Sa'i'ah, which denotes a smaller sin. Next up at number nine, we have Itham. Now, some scholars believe that the basic meaning of Itham is an unlawful deed that's committed intentionally. This is in contrast with themba, and themba can be both intentional and unintentional. However, it is based on the context of a particular situation. There's a passage in the Quran in Surah 2 verses 173 that says, He has only forbidden to you dead animals, blood, and the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. But whosoever is forced by necessity, neither desiring it nor transgressing its limits, there is no sin upon him. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So that passage gives you sort of an example of the particular context that this would be used in. The consumption of haram, like you're drinking a beer, the, 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 the zina of the eyes, it's pretty major. Kati'a comes in at number eight. Now this is considered by many scholars to be a moral lapse or a mistake. So this interpretation has led some scholars to believe that Kati'a is a lesser sin than Ithim. However, the word Kati'a is frequently used in conjunction with Ithim in the Quran. Now in the Quran Surah 4 verses 112, it says, by whoever earns an offense or a sin and then blames it to an innocent person has taken upon himself a slander and manifest sin. So this verse in the Quran really indicates that Kati'a is considered an ithem, which is a grave sin. So you can see in this verse in the Quran, it indicates that Kati'a is considered an ithem, a grave sin. Next up, we have germ. Now, this is a word that's often considered a synonym with them because it is used to describe some of the same sins, like spreading lies against God and not believing the signs of God. In the Quran, the word mostly appears in the form of mudrim, which means one who commits a germ. The people who do this are described in the Quran as having arrogance towards the believers. In the Quran, Surah 83 verses 29 to 32, it says, Indeed, those who committed crimes used to laugh at those who believed. And when they passed by them, they would exchange derisive glances. And when they returned to their people, they would return jesting. And when they saw them, they would say, indeed, those are truly lost. At number six, we have oh. Juna and Haraj. Juna and Haraj have a similar meaning to that of Itham, and it's a sin that warrants a punishment. Now, in fact, these words are used almost interchangeably with Etham in the same chapters in the Quran. Like the term Etham, you'll often find these words in legislative portions of the Quran, specifically relating to regulations regarding marriage and divorce. Now in the Quran, Surah 2 verses 235, you'll find that it says this, There is no blame upon you for that which you indirectly allude concerning a proposal to women or for what you conceal within yourselves. Allah knows that you will have them in mind, but do not promise them secretly except for saying a proper saying. And do not determine to undertake a marriage contract until the decreed period reaches its end. 
and know that Allah knows what is within yourself, so beware of Him. And know that Allah is forgiving and forbearing. Number five, we have Al-Kibara. Now, the most heinous sins in Islam are known as Al-Kibara, which translates to great or major one. While every sin is seen as an offense to God, Al-Kibara are the gravest of the offenses, and some of them include shirk, which is associating partners with Allah. Then there is committing murder, and there's also the practice of black magic and leaving daily prayers. And then we have zakat invasion, which is avoiding your obligatory duty to give to charity. But explaining more of the examples from number five, this is where we get more into the specific sins. So let's talk about shirk. Shirk means associating partners with Allah, and this is a very serious prohibition. The Prophet Muhammad was recorded to have said these words, shall I not tell you of the most serious of the major sins? We said, of course, O Messenger of Allah. He said, associating anything in worship with Allah. And in the Quran, Surah 4 verses 48, it says, Indeed, Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with Allah have certainly fabricated a tremendous sin. Associating partners with Allah is the greatest sin in Islam, and it's the only sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises will never, he will never forgive on the day of judgment. Number three, we have black Ooh. magic. So there's sorcery, witchcraft, divination, astrology, fortune telling, and all of that is included under the heading of sorcery and black magic. And this is one of the major sins in Islam that can actually condemn somebody to hell. The Quran has this following passage, and they followed instead what the devils had recited during the reign of Solomon. It was not Solomon who disbelieved, but the devils disbelieved, teaching people magic and that which was revealed to the two angels at Babylon, Harut and Marut. But the two angels do not teach anyone unless they say, we are a trial, so do not disbelieve by practicing magic. And yet they learn from them that by which they cause separation between a man and his wife but they do not harm anyone through it except by permission of Allah. And the people learn what harms them and does not benefit them, but the children of Israel certainly knew that whoever purchased the magic would not have the hereafter any share. And wretched is that for which they sold themselves, if they only knew. And that passage is taken from the Quran, Surah 2, verses 102. Then at number two, this sin is stealing from Orphans. So the guardians and the caretakers of orphans should use the property in their trust in a very correct manner and only for the benefit of the orphan. So a caretaker should be very careful not to spend any of the orphan's money because, you know, this is considered a very serious offense in the religion of Islam. So being responsible for the welfare of an orphan is a great responsibility not to be taken lightly. In the Quran, Surah 4, verses 10, it says, Indeed, those who devour the property of orphans unjustly are only consuming into their bellies fire, and they will be burned in a blaze. Eating the wealth of the orphan. That orphan is defenseless in your care. You have to protect that orphan and protect his uh, property. And finally, at number one, we have committing murder. Now, this is one of the gravest sins in the religion of Islam. And of course, you know, this is due to the fact that the religion of Islam really embodies a code of ethics that's designed to protect the rights of individuals, including his or her right to live in a secure community. And now it was recorded that the Prophet Muhammad had said these words, a man will continue to be sound in his religion so long as he does not shed blood, which it is forbidden to shed. The third thing is murder. And uh, we know that this is condemned again and again in the Quran. So our first thing on the list of harams are eating carrion, blood, or pork meat. The Quran is very clear about which meats are acceptable for consumption and which meats are considered sinful if eaten. It is a commonly known fact that followers of Islam must not eat pork products or meat that is still bloody and has not been thoroughly cooked. It is also forbidden to eat carrion or decaying flesh of dead animals. Any meat that is consumed must also be halal, meaning the meat has been slaughtered and prepared as prescribed by Muslim law. Now, I found it very interesting that the Quran does mention that if one is in a state of starvation and has absolutely no choice but to eat these meats, 
out of pure desperation and survival that Allah is forgiving and merciful. In Surah 16, Ayah 115, the Holy Quran states that Allah has forbidden you only carrion and blood and the flesh of swine, also any animal over which the name of any other than Allah has been pronounced. But whoever eats of them under compelling necessity neither desiring it nor exceeding the limit of absolute necessity, surely for such action, Allah is much forgiving and most merciful. All right, moving on to talking about the making of statues and pictures. Allah describes himself as the almighty and original creator through titles such as Al-Khaliq, the creator of everything out of nothingness, and Al-Fatir, the bringer into existence, giving every living thing its particular nature, objective, and meaning. Now, there are many hadiths that discuss the sin of producing statues and pictures to imitate human form. These hadiths state that the image makers are cursed. They are called some of the most evil creations. They will be most severely punished on the day of judgment, and they will be punished until they breathe life into their creations. However, they will never be able to do that, and the angels will not enter houses in which there are statues. It is also believed that if a person, or an artist, really wanted to depict or create the essence of a human being by means of either painting or sculpture, he will then have encroached upon the rights and authority that belong to only Allah. And it is believed that those who compete with Allah in creation will receive the greatest punishment on the Day of Judgment, for that is a blasphemous act. Let's talk about marital relations. So there is some discussion about a wife refusing to engage in marital relations with her husband. On the basis of the following hadith, it is generally understood that if a wife refuses relations with her husband, she will be cursed by the angel. Abu Huraira reports from the Prophet that when a husband calls his wife to bed and she refuses, and as a result the husband spends the night in anger, then angels curse the wife all night until dawn. Bukhari. Interestingly, in Islam, it is believed that a husband and wife protect the chastity of one another by providing one another a legitimate means of satisfying their physical urges. This protection of chastity is essential for the preservation of the family unit. Hence, anything which puts chastity in jeopardy is disliked by the Almighty. However, it's important to mention that the basis of refusal by the husband or wife must also be taken into consideration. For example, if either of them is tired, sick, or simply not in the proper mood and in the appropriate frame of mind, then it certainly does not entail any wrath of the Almighty. It is only when a spouse starts to deliberately evade such natural needs of the other that the attitude becomes questionable. Fact number seven, the sin of spying and eavesdropping on others' private conversations. So according to Islam, it is not permissible to engage in Namima, which is malicious gossip, and spying on private conversations. Namima is considered a major sin as it involves sharing what others have said in order to cause trouble among them. The definition of Namima is also uncovering secrets and disclosing that which is not appropriate to disclose. Hence, followers of Islam should keep silent and refrain from telling everything that they see of people's situations, unless speaking of it will bring some benefit to a Muslim or to ward off some harm. This can be seen in the Quran, Surah 49, Ayah 12, where it is said, O ye who believe, avoid suspicion as much as possible. For suspicion in some cases is a sin, and spy not on each other behind their backs. Would any of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? Nay, ye would abhor it. But fear Allah, for Allah is oft returning most merciful. It is also narrated in Al Sahihain from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, Beware of suspicion, for suspicion is the falsest of speech. Do not eavesdrop, do not spy on one another, do not envy one another, do not forsake one another, do not hate one another. Be, O oh, slaves of Allah, brothers. Al Bukhari. Next, we'll be talking about the sin of women appearing like men and vice versa. So according to Islam, Allah's curse is upon women who appear like men and upon men who appear like women. In his book, Lawful and the Prohibited in Islam, Yusuf al karadawi the prominent religious scholar, writes, the Prophet declared that a woman should not wear a man's clothing or vice versa. 
He cursed men who imitate women and women who imitate men. Furthermore, the evil of such conduct, which affects both the life of the individual and that of the society, is that it constitutes a rebellion against the natural order of things. According to this natural order, there are men and there are women, and each of the two sexes has its own distinctive characteristics. However, if men become effeminate and women masculinized, this natural order will be reversed and will disintegrate. It is believed that among those who are cursed by Allah and his angels, both in this world and in the hereafter, the Prophet has mentioned that a man whom Allah has created as male, but who becomes effeminate by imitating women, and a woman whom Allah has created as female, but who becomes masculinized by imitating men. For this reason, the Prophet forbade men from wearing clothes or things pertaining to women. Fact number five brings us to talk about the sin of ending your own life. Now, as is common in many religions, ending one's own life is seen as a great sin. Allah does not permit his believers to intentionally end their own lives in any way. This can be seen through verses of the Holy Quran and Hadith. In Surah 6, Ayah 151, Allah says, And do not kill the soul which Allah has forbidden to be killed, except by legal right. This He has instructed you that you may use reason. In Surah 4, Ayah 29, Allah says, Nor kill yourselves, for verily Allah has been to you most merciful. If any do that in rancor and injustice, soon we shall cast them into the fire, and it is easy for Allah to do so. So essentially, Islam advises that life does not belong to us like property. Rather, it is granted to every human being as a trust. Neither is it allowable for a person to take another human's life without justification, nor is it permissible for one in Islam to destroy their own existence. God has declared both of these actions as grave sins. Let's take a look at some of the habits that are forbidden in Islam, such as drinking alcoholic beverages and gambling. Now, Islam does not permit believers to engage in behaviors such as drinking alcohol and gambling, as they are deemed to be sinful acts. The Holy Quran states that, For those who engage in these activities, in them is a great sin, and some profit for men, but the sin is greater than the profit. It also mentions that, O oh, ye who believe, intoxicants and gambling stones and arrows are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Abstain such that you may prosper. Satan's plan is to excite hatred between you with intoxicants and gambling and to hinder you from the remembrance of Allah. And from prayer will you not then abstain. Fact number three, the sin of committing adultery or fornication. Now, chastity is defined as controlling oneself from forbidden desires due to the love of Allah the Almighty in response to his command as well as for seeking his reward in return. Islam has always supported the idea of chaste living and has thus legislated many laws that reduce the strong impact of these desires and control them. It has also encouraged remaining on the straight path and warned against giving into unlawful desires of the flesh. Fornication and adultery are forbidden and classified as major and destructive sins. Islam has even forbidden everything that could lead to these sins, such as immoral exchanges of looks between two sexes, depraved words, seductive moves, an unmarried and unrelated man and a woman being in a room alone together, and anything else which could lead to sin. In Surah 17, Ayah 32, Allah the Almighty says what means, and come not near to unlawful sex. Verily, it is a great sin and an evil way that leads to hell unless forgiven by Allah. This opens the road for other evils. When a man commits adultery, faith comes out of his heart and hovers above him until he leaves the sin. Then faith comes back to him again. All right, let's talk a little bit about the sin of not performing prayer. So, salat or prayer, is the most important practice in Islam because it is daily worship. Since the Arabic word salat is rooted in the word silat, which means connection or contact, the best translation for salat is contact prayer. Like other religious duties, the contact prayers are a gift from God. It is believed that souls need nourishment just like the body needs nourishment from food. Without nourishment, souls will not grow and develop. It is believed that the five contact prayers are like meals 
for the soul. They are spread throughout the day, like meals for the body, and consist of dawn, noon, afternoon, sunset, and nighttime prayer. Those who do not develop their soul cannot be close to God because they will not be able to stand his immense energy. Thus, they will end up astray, away from God. Now, there are several passages in the Quran that address the importance of daily prayer. In Surah 19, Ayah 59, the Quran mentions that then there has succeeded them a posterity who has given up prayers and followed lusts. So they will be thrown in hell except those who repent. And bringing us down to our fact number one, an action of sin is not fasting on a day of Ramadan without proper excuse. Fasting during Ramadan is one of the pillars of Islam, and it is not permissible for a Muslim to fail to fast it except without a reasonable excuse. Whoever fails to fast during Ramadan or breaks the fast during this time for a legitimate excuse such as sickness, travel, or pregnancy is required to make up the days that they did not fast. As for one who does not fast the month of Ramadan deliberately out of heedlessness, even if that is just one day of the month in the sense of that he does not intend to fast it at all, or he breaks the fast after having started to fast with no excuse, he has committed a major sin and must repent. Surah 2, Ayah 183 mentions, O you who have believed, decreed upon you is fasting, as it was decreed upon those before you that you may become righteous. With the above verse, the Holy Quran makes it very clear that fasting was ordained compulsory on all Muslims and that they have to fast if they are to stay righteous.